Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. And welcome to Expo Chicago, the international exposition for contemporary and modern art. My name is Stephanie Cristello. I am the director of programming here at Expo Chicago, as well as the editor-in-chief of The Scene, Chicago's international journal for contemporary and modern art. Today, it is my pleasure to welcome you all to Dialogues, presented in partnership with the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Dialogues is a year-round program of provocative artistic discourse, discussions, and conversations featuring leading artists and curators on the current issues that engage them. Today, as part of our panel, we will be presenting uh, a discussion based on the US Pavilion at the Venice Architecture Biennale entitled Dimensions of Citizenship. I wanted to just take a moment and do a special thank you to our media partner, Cultured Magazine, as well as the co-commissioners of the US Pavilion, the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, and the University of Chicago. Today, our panel will include Keller Easterling, who is an architect, writer, and professor at Yale University. Laura Kurgan, Associate Professor of Architecture at the Graduate School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation at Columbia University. Robert Jared Pietresco, Associate Professor of Landscape Architecture, Harvard University Graduate School of Design. And it will be moderated by Mimi Zeiger, who is one of the co-curators of the US Pavilion this year. This discussion will be followed by a book signing, um, which will just be to the right of the stage. So for all of you who did not have a catalog from Dimensions of Citizenship, I join you. Um, I would welcome you to join us there for uh, a book signing of this, as well as Dirk Dennison's 10 Houses, uh, which is launching recently. So please join me in giving a very warm welcome to our panelists. Thank you all. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, on behalf of myself and US Pavilion co-curators, uh, Anne Louis, who is here, um, Neil Atkinson, who is still in Italy, Iker Gill, who generally is around town, um, but is not here today, um, and um, our commissioners, um, the University of Chicago and the School of the Art Institute, Institute of Chicago, I'd like to extend a very warm thank you to Stephanie and to all the folks at Expo, like Bianca, um, who worked to organize this panel. Uh, so today I'm going to share a few thoughts about dimensions of citizenship, the exhibition currently on view at the Venice Architecture Biennale, and then Keller and Laura and Bobby will sort of explain their projects um, more in depth, and then we'll have this conversation. Um, so the theme of the U.S. Pavilion this year is Dimensions of Citizenship. And as the title suggests, it looks at this relationship between architecture and citizenship, and it's a provocative topic, especially since circumstances in the United States, in Europe, and around the world indicate that it's urgent that architecture, art, and design respond to shifting conditions of belonging. Um, so Dimensions of Citizenship argues that architecture's collective agency lies in our ability to produce what Afrofuturist author Samuel R. Delaney calls necessary, clear, and vital images of tomorrow. But what really are these images? How should we represent the spatial conditions of belonging that go beyond conventional constructs of nationhood or sovereignty that go beyond walls or maps or flags or even like AP photographs of migrants. As curators, when addressing these difficult topics, we wanted to break it down and so we used this idea of the scale to organize the galleries and to explore belonging in Venice. And so as I take you through the projects, I'll also be taking you through the seven scales that are sort of telescopic in nature. So what we see here is um, the image of the courtyard of the US Pavilion in the Giardini. And it shows here thrival geographies. In my mind, I see a line by Amanda Williams, Andres Hernandez, and Shawnee Crow. And it's at the scale of design, didn't let you know already, of the citizen. 
And their work takes on the mantra, black women's space matters through materiality and enclosure, as we see here with their incredible sculpture, which sort of sweeps through the courtyard and up onto the roof. This work uses steel and hand braided cord and explores the space in which marginalized people can begin to do more than just survive, but they can actually thrive. And here um, is Studio Gang's work, which addresses the scale of Civitas by bringing hundreds of cobblestones from a site along the Mississippi River that's seen the city's troubled history of racial uh, inequities, um, including slavery. The map on the wall was hand drawn, and it's the sort of the floodplain of the Mississippi, was hand drawn by Jeannie Gang in, Ven in Venice. And the work itself is a step in a longer process to create civic monuments for Memphis, um, one that is shared and speaks to the complex history and possible collective futures for all city residents. Moving through that same gallery, here is Scape, a landscape architecture's piece, which explores the scale of the region. Um, it uses the idea of ecological citizenship and the Venice Lagoon as a case study. And this project we think of as a call to action um, by presenting these tools, and you can see them here, whether they're these blocks of e-concrete or the core logs. These are sort of ways of remediate, remediating wetland loss. Um, that the citizens themselves can act as guardians and allies of both marine life, the critters, um, and the wetlands, the muck. And here at the scale of the nation is a studio Teddy Cruz and Fauna Foreman's idea that challenges a status, the idea that a nation may demand a wall. What they've mapped here is the watersheds of the US-Mexico border and creates a piece called Mexis, the combination of Mexico and the US. Um, it's a border region, uh, a transnational environmental commons, which prioritizes flow across the border, flows of social, economic, and ecological natures that sort of do away with barrier. So I've been taking you sort of through the first two galleries in the pavilion as if we were walking through them, and then we have this break underneath the, what we're calling the transit screening lounge under the rotunda. Which, you can see the super graphics that are designed by Infoco. Um, it's here under the rotunda that the transit screening lounge presents a suite of films and video works that raise questions about citizenship through movement. Um, and featured among others are um, Chicago-based David Reuter and Marissa Lee Benedict, whose work Dark Fiber tracks the network of infrastructure that binds us all together, as well as Cosmic Generator, and you can sort of see the fabulous sort of image in the background there, um, by Buenos Aires' Juan Mika Rottenberg, that imagines a world of secret tunnels that connect the US and Mexico via a commodities market in China. And then here, we'll resume our powers of 10-like progression through the galleries um, at the scale of the globe. Uh, Laura and Bobby will tell us more about their collaboration with Diller, Scafidio, and Renfro, as well as the Columbia Center for Spatial Research. Um, but just a little briefly, um, they use data from NASA satellites to challenge the idea of a global village. And here's a couple more. Um, this work is entitled In Plain Sight, and it explores a suite, through a suite of case studies, um, a kind of questioning of the an an anomalies um, in the ways that we count global populations. Um, really, in asking who counts, um, we wonder, you know, how do we visualize a citizen um, when we are looking from far away as space? And as we move to the last gallery, um, Keller will explain more about hers in a minute. Um, but Keller and her team use the scale of the network to ask, what if we don't want the citizenship or even the asylum that nations reluctantly withhold or bestow? And here's more of the super graphic and the 
uh, get up close, we can see that this is a, a mobile app which acts as a matchmaker in between those with needs and those with assets. Um, it tunnels through the loopholes and the bureaucracy of visas, of tourism, and NGOs. And then lastly, at the scale of the cosmos, design Earth's speculative design illustrates possible off-world scenarios. Um, these geo stories act as a black mirror of current on-world crises, and we close the exhibition um, with visions of entrepreneurship and extraction. And it's with these heads that we see here sort of floating against um, Keller's super graphic of many um, that we sort of are seeing the gods of the new space age carved out of asteroids, which just goes to show us that we can't escape the inequities we face here on spaceship Earth um, when we blast into the heavens. So that's my mini tour of Dimensions of Citizenship, just to give you a context um, for which we'll be talking about these two works and this sort of ongoing questioning of what visualization of belonging um, does. And with that, I'm going to pass over to Keller. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, so when, uh, when the curators of the U.S. Pavilion in, in invited us to uh, contribute something at the network scale, I knew we had to um, contribute something that we had already been, st had started to work on in advanced studios at Yale. Um, the, the kind of work I do ordinarily is studying this kind of space, you know, the space of uh, the kind of global infrastructure space um, that's kind of perfectly streamlined, uh, all the movements of of billions of products and tens of millions of cheap laborers and tourists around the world, um, but somehow can't manage to move uh, X million people away from atrocities in, like those in Syria. Somehow, at that point, there's uh, no ingenuity, no invention, uh, no ability to change laws, uh, or even, even if not moving away from conflicts, moving away, finding robust ways to move people away from environmental um, uh, m needs for migration as well. Um, so the nation state kind of just has a dumb on-off button um, to, to grant or deny citizenship or asylum, and the NGocracy offers as its best idea um, detention or storage in a refugee camp lasting on average 17 years. And the migrations that we've been looking at in these last years, you know, have become incredibly contentious and um, uh, all uh, polarizing. Um, m those who are migrating portrayed as victims or the other in a kind of binary to right-wing xenophobia. And even, you know, in our culture, in our art culture, the portrayal of the, the migrating individual as a victim, we're really comfortable with that. And when we started working on this at Yale, we kind of uh, uh, rankled at the idea that if we were designers who were going to be engaging in this, the, the assumption was that we were going to be fixing up the tent you know, or rushing up to the actual barrier or, or border crossing to, to do something. Um, you know, in other words, kind of um, accepting a downstream assignment within a really bad idea. So the, the many project asks, you know, what if you could um, alter the temperament or disposition or, or of this whole situation, reduce the violence of it by moving away from the sharp end of the conflict and um, working on a kind of remote set of switches within larger networks. So kind of moving away from this one or binary or closed loop to, uh, to a kind of multiplying of one-to-one -one relationships that have often been the most successful ways to manage migration. So away from the one and the binary to the one-to-one -one and the many. And many, oh, this is um, reverse a little bit. doesn't really look that way. But um, uh, many is an, an online platform um, that we offered to the uh, 
to the exhibition that's designed to facilitate migration through an exchange of needs. So it refuses to regard migrating people as victims. It serves those who want to resettle, but also those who, who want to keep traveling, as Mimi said, who don't really want the citizenship that the nation is withholding or, or reluctantly bestowing. So in, in many ways, it's, it's designed for those who might say, uh, you know, I, I don't really want your citizenship or your victimhood or your structured racism or your bad ideas, your bad jobs, you know, like I, I don't want to stay in your country. Um, and instead, it's trying to build another kind of cosmopolitan mobility that's based around a more robust networking of short-term project-based visas um, uh, that are um, offered in exchange for uh, global credentials. So it's sort of asking, could there be a global form of matchmaking between all the sideline talents of those who are traveling uh, and a multitude of needs around the world? Um, it's kind of also saying that one does not trying to eliminate problems or find a solution. This is not something for which there is a solution. Instead, this is a platform that's trying to multiply problems. So it's sort of um, uh, needs and problems are assets so that Often in the scenarios, cities are bargaining with their underexploited, often failed assets um, to attract a changing influx of talent and, and resources, sort of matching their needs with the needs of mobile people to generate mutual benefits. So space and times and problems and failures and opportunities in these kind of non-market exchanges. Um, so since these are no work visas, then suddenly spatial assets that might even be worth less than nothing after a financial crisis become valuable in-kind contributions. Um, and like a kind of no-tech blockchain, it's a group-to-group -group exchange. Um, so it's asking if there are kind of intervals of time or seasons of life in which you might form a more branching set of options that would be more practical and more politically agile. And at the Biennale, we showed about 100 of these kind of representative examples, uh, which we're now working on in the spring at Yale with a consortium of players to really take the, the app and move it forward. One of the things we wanted to talk about today was how a Biennale and things consumed in a Biennale are not kind of the end in itself, but one way to kind of um, advance a project. I, I would sort of hasten to say that, um, that um, you know, it, it, this is in, in no way uh, pretending that the visa uh, system is not fraught and dangerous. This is not a kind of sunny one world sharing app. Um, but instead, it's kind of arguing for a kind of low tech app, almost like a bulletin board that prompts changes in cities in kind of heavy information systems. Um, it's inspired by things like um, Fluxus member Jurgis Machunas's spell your name with these objects, or um, Paul Elliman's typographies, or uh, Hobo Code, or Cuneiform. And there was a video that um, uh, accompanied the work of inspired by um, Hong Kong artist Habik Chuen's in, uh, incredible uh, collages. So the scenarios were um, uh, was often taking formerly toxic or land bank properties and letting them be in, in, in these kind of in-kind contributions or it was one about solar energy that altering uh, migration flows. Uh, in our research, we found a lot of uh, needs for exchanges with medical talents um, uh, around the world. Um, in, in many ways, uh, the, the site is not unlike the way anyone would use a university now as a sort of four-year way to uh, fork in the road to change ideas uh, later on. Um, we found an abundance of, of these kinds of educational networks that are now uh, exchanging things about agriculture and uh, climate and the state of the planet that are really ripe for these kinds of internships. Um, we also found um, 
didn't quite look like this. Um, uh, we also found ways to match young and old, uh, able-bodied and disabled. Um, so these are the kinds of scenarios we're carrying on with uh, in, in the research um, in the hopes of getting it a little closer to, to a developer and with some trepidation, you know, uh, how, how does a, a platform like this avoid the very dangers that it critiques or, you know, and in the end, can there be a kind of string of journeys that, that is anticipated and celebrated and that, that gives to those people who are moving the credentials to be world, the world leaders, our next uh, world leaders, the, the, the people who we think of as not kind of belonging anywhere, belonging everywhere. So with that, I'll pass it on to Laura and Bobby <laughs> to talk about. Uh, I'm Laura Krogan, and I, I teach at Columbia, and I wear another hat as director of the Center for Spatial Research. And I'm Robert Petrusco. I'm an associate professor of landscape architecture at Harvard University. And um, Laura and I, the next slide, we just have this little prompt as um, something that we share in the work that we both do, whatever types of um, sort of form that it takes on. It's this idea that new ways of seeing helps us produce new ways of knowing. Um, perhaps a kind of conventional thing for those of us who think through representation, but it's kind of at the core of the projects that we, uh, we do in collaboration with each other. Okay, so we don't really need to go further into the slide because Mimi did um, a great introduction, but just you know, thank you Mimi and Anne and Neil because it's an incredibly hard task. I know Venice sounds like a really romantic place, but it's a very hard place to put a show together. And so thank you for, for doing that. And Bobby and I were sort of added to the team um, uh, at, the, at the last minute and we were really happy. <laughs> at the last minute, yeah. Um, okay, yeah, that's out of order. That's yeah. okay. Yeah, go for it. I think it's yeah. just one slide back. Yeah, okay, there you go. Yeah. Um, anyway, so our, our piece, uh, In Plain Sight, uh, as Mimi had mentioned, was uh, also in collaboration with Dillar Scafidio and Renfro. And for um, us, this was a kind of revisiting of a collaboration we had uh, done 10 years earlier, uh, a piece called Exit uh, that was initially commissioned by the Foundation Cartier uh, in Paris where Laura, myself, and Diller Scafidi and Renfro uh, collaborated on uh, data-driven narratives about human migration at a global scale uh, in relation to a number of sort of geopolitical dynamics. And um, so on the kind of 10-year anniversary of that piece and with dimensions of citizenship as a, a fantastic prompt, we, visit, we revisited those techniques and imagined In Plain Sight as potentially an additional chapter to that piece that we had done before. And actually, um, just just to say that 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 former piece was commissioned by um, not was commissioned by Paul for um, by the Cartier Foundation at the prompt of Paul Virilio, who recently passed away. So it's also a thank you a thank yeah. you to him for sort of setting all of this work in motion, um, and to link it to to Keller's networked um, piece as well. That piece was about the political, economic, um, and environmental reasons that set people in motion around the world. And we very much, um, in that show, dealt with everything at the, at the global scale. Um, so the, the last piece, Exits, was really using the blue marble, and that's the Earth as seen from space by astronauts in 1973, and it was that first image of a vulnerable, singular, globe that we all had to be stewards of and take care of, take care of. Um, and it unrolled and sort of stamped out all these global data sets. Um, and the, we had a hunch um, for this new show, um, especially for the prompt of citizenship, um, looking at, the, at what's called the black marble nowadays, which is a brand new and much higher resolution uh, image that had ever been produced before of the night lights on Earth. And it often stands in for the networks that Keller spoke about so, um, so fantastically. But 
you know, this myth that there is a network that holds the globe together, um, you know, and produces all the, you know, smooth financial economies that set a lot of things in motion. And we just had a hunch that there were a lot of gaps. In fact, you can see all the gaps. There's, you know, the lights, um, yeah. We'll, we'll keep showing that to you. Okay. Um, so, in talking about the blue marble versus the black marble, uh, the blue marble normally cir uh, circulates as a type of imagery. We think about it as photographic. And yet, when we get into the work that we were doing together, um, we have to transition from that idea of sort of a photographic realism to a type of data realism, or the way that a number of agencies um, and institutions use geographic data at a global scale to make the same types of arguments about a sort of transparent view uh, on the world. And so the data sets that we were interested in, we sort of had to peel off the globe and treat as a type of materiality that had its own kind of physical properties and embedded, in so, uh, embedded assumptions. There, we work with two primarily. Uh, the first, of course, that Laura mentioned is the nighttime lights, and also uh, a second called uh, the gridded population of the world. Um, yeah, so this is the, the, so the night lights is a photograph, as, as Bobby's saying, it's sensed, um, taken at night at 1 a.m. Uh, in the morning. So what you're seeing really are the lights of infrastructure, not the domestic lights of people um, spread around the globe. And the gridded population um, are the census counts taken by governments all around the world, which are put together by a lab at Columbia named Season. And they take all this data and they pixelate it so that one pixel um, of this image is one kilometer, one kilometer on Earth, and it also counts up the number of people who are living on that square kilometer. Um, so, do you want to talk about oh, yeah. sure. So we, in considering these two data sets that are used in a number of ways in order to tell stories about sort of global populations, uh, we are interested in comparing them and specifically looking at the gaps between them um, through kind of a simple sort of algorithm you could imagine as subtraction. Uh, we looked at places where there were presence of lights in the nighttime lights data set, but an absence of people in the gridded population of the world data set. And alternatively, we looked at those other types of gaps where there were high population counts, uh, but no presence of lights uh, in the other image. And these we treated as anomalies that we thought might hold the key to kind of interesting and important stories about the gap between narratives we talk, we, we sort of circulate about development and modernization and electricity and narratives that have to do with where people are located on Earth. Um, you can skip ahead. Yeah, so, yeah, so, so it's, it's, it's really important that we began with this hunch, right? We, lots of conversations, looked at these two images and you know, really thought we'd come up with this idea um, that, you know, there would be these gaps. And then once we did the subtraction um, of the two images, we found 16,000 points. And the yellow ones are where there are lights and no people. And the blue ones are where there are people um, and no lights. And then from there, um, you know, we had the show to design. <laughs> and so we had to come up um, with stories based on these 16,000 points. Um, so we use those points um, just as a way of pointing our attention to where there could be interesting stories. And we, we, sp we split it up into kind of two main chapters, one being uh, places where there were lights and no people, and places where there were people and no lights. And that's actually where we started. Um, and attempted to taxonomize in a very rough way um, imagining an audience that's moving through a room very quickly and perhaps only glancing at the work, um, how could we come up with a, an explanatory framework for thinking about places where there were people but no lights? And we came up with sort of eight rough categories um, and using uh, our sort of visualization methods, sampled various moments of blackness, uh, darkness, um, across the nighttime lights data set um, that corresponded to places that had population. Go to the next. Um, our eight categories uh, then that we, we focused on were wealthy enclaves, uh, refugee camps, places where there were power outages, um, mostly due to political conflicts, 
um, cities that have been uh, denied light for various reasons, isolated villages, extraction settlements, informal settlements, and indigenous territories. Um, through the lens of the nighttime lights data set, um, these are all populations that are not sort of seen as part of the modern project. So this is the very abstract view, and then we shifted from that into the more, you know, what most people think now as the naturalized, naturalized satellite view, where you could see evidence um, of you know, the fact that there were people living, although it was completely black in that night lights image of the world. Um, and then from there, we generalized. And this is now 128 places around the world um, within those same five categories um, to show that there are many more conditions like that around the world. And that became sort of the mode of storytelling, zooming in on a place, showing it as a pattern, and then showing the 128 um, as a grid around the world. Right, and then that's the abstracted view of that, of that same grid. So these are many places in the world where there are a lot of people living and no night lights. So the darkness here is not screen darkness, it's sampling the nighttime lights imagery um, right. at, at its pixel level. It's the gaps in the, in the nighttime lights. And then on the sort of flip side of that, um, we were looking at situations uh, where we had lights, but seemingly the absence of people. And similarly to the first half, uh, we created a rough taxonomy of the conditions that we were interested in exploring. Um, in each of those cases, we zoomed very far in uh, once we kind of picked out representative uh, instances. And here we can see the nighttime lights and all their abstraction, highly pixelated at uh, the one kilometer scale. And the categories. Oh, of the, yeah. the, yes, and then our, the eight categories that we worked through for the show were situations like industrial farms, power plants, ports, tourism sites, natural gas extraction, military bases, borders, and strip mines. Now, when we say that there are no people here, we don't sort of mean that in a ground truth way. We mean that in the way that in the data sets that represent the locations of where people are, the people that are in these, these locations are not accounted for. So in some of them, they have all of the sort of uh, electri electrical signature of a high amount of development, and yet you might find um, a series of foreign workers there. Or in other cases, such as a tourism site, you might find that it's heavily populated, but not by people who are citizens in that location, that it's used by people, but the people that it's kind of pointed towards are not people who are, who are um, part of the country's population. Okay, so when we zoomed, we, um, we zoomed in on these three conditions. The one was a natural grass extraction site in Peru, the other was a tourism site in Punta Cana, and the third, and this was the brightest anomaly, was a strip mine uh, in the middle of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Um, okay, so I'm gonna show all right, so this was the mode of, of storytelling. It began with a one-liner, and it's telling you about the Cov mine in the south of the DCR, which is operated by Glencore, a multinational company. And if you can see over there, there's a dam, and it is connected by a high-voltage line to this open pit mine, which is a copper, it's a copper mine. And then along the way, and you'll see them highlighted soon, uh, villages and quite large towns which showed up as dark spots on the, on the night light images. And so what it's showing in terms of citizenship and global uh, accountability is that the government of the DCR prioritizes sending electricity to the mine rather than to the towns which have very uneven electricity. So those are the eight places that are connected in this data narrative. And then from there, really the brightest 
it was actually the, the, the brightest point in the whole global image of those 16,000 points that we showed at the beginning. And then these are the 128 mines that Glencore owns around the world. And if we had zoomed in on every one of those other points, probably the same types of conditions would have shown up. we showed them on the map. So that was the sort of the mode of storytelling of each of each of the zooms. So and then we felt we were in the US pavilion. Um, but it turned out that the United States has, uh, you know, according to statistics, 100% access to electricity, like a lot of uh, European, a, a, lot of, a lot of countries around the world actually have 100% access to electricity. But in the United States, once there is a disaster, things become very unequal very fast. So um, to, to finish the piece, we focused on um, a recent narrative um, on unequal rights relative to electricity activated uh, by a storm event. So uh, we chose Hurricane Harvey in relationship to Houston and Hurricane Maria in relation to Puerto Rico. So we did a pairwise comparison of these two, uh, two hurricanes that were of equal magnitude that happened within 30 days of each other. Um, and using the nighttime lights data set, we're able to compare uh, the nature of the response to, to both of these crises. So here we are doing a comparison, zooming in. Uh, Houston on the left, Puerto Rico on the right. So we see here both were category four storms. So these are the sort of light signatures of each. And then looking first at Harvey and Houston, you can see that after the storm, there was uh, just a bit over 4% of the population was, out, was without power. Um, but within 11 days after the storm, it was uh, fully restored. Okay, then another set of citizens in Puerto Rico, after the storm, 100% without power, according to statistics in the news. 11 days after, 95% uh, still without power, even though if we, we see here 11 days in Houston, everything was fully restored. 128, uh, excuse me, 120 days after the storm, uh, still 30% without power. And certainly at that time, uh, when the show was being mounted, there were news reports, as there are today, about the continuing uh, problems of uh, infrastructural stability in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria. So, through this comparison, we were able to highlight within uh, a data set that doesn't seem to be about telling stories of inequity. Um, here at home, uh, very important stories of inequity that show up uh, in this particular data set. Yeah, and this image over here is a stand-in, you know, for opening for for opening up the discussion. And it's people people really sat and watched. The whole, the whole narrative, and we were we were very proud of that. Um, but you know, you do projects like this, and we're aestheticizing um, many things in the world that are that are unequal, that are hard, very hard to solve, naughty problems, as a lot of people call them. And so, you know, the question the question is always, and actually, some of the reviews um, ask this, you know. Um, you're pointing out all these things, but is this is this enough um, to just show show and tell? You know, I like to call these kinds of data visualizations show and tell. Um, so we can we can discuss that as we as we move on. Okay. Well, let, let's maybe start with that question since you 
sort of have lobbed it up here so <laughs> eloquently. And I have to first say, like, what a pleasure it is to revisit these projects with you um, a few months later because the power and beauty and humor and politics of them um, continues to just like make me so excited um, to see them. Uh, and I'm very excited that we'll be able to show them again here in Chicago in a few months um, when, when, when I'll get you all that information soon, but it, it, it's happening. Um, so, so let's talk about that. Uh, you know, there were, let's talk with the critiques, right? Like we, we got um, the critique mainly, and people really responded quite well to the pavilion, but was what is this difference between pointing out that something mm -hmm. is going on in the world, which I think architects are often critiqued at the research scale for like identifying uh, something that's wrong and then making a project about it, but that project um, is not necessarily at the, uh, the sharp end of the crisis, to use your term, Keller, like that, that in a way an audience wants the, uh, wants the architecture to be at the scale of the human, and yet we're at this larger scale uh, of the globe or the network um, trying to sort of sort these things out. So it does, I guess the question I have really is where does the change happen within this, or, or do you feel a responsibility towards that kind of change making? Um, you want me to answer since that's <laughs> my fault the question <laughs> started? I'll start with the um, easy ones. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think you, you can't see things if you can't show them, right? So I think problems, uh, problems that are endemic to various uh, in various parts of the world to people on the ground, to people who are there, they know, they know what the problems are, um, um, but they need representation. So representation can be both aesthetic, it can be political, it can be, you know, first showing, showing uh, that the problem is there before you can do something about it, and then it's about pulling, like Keller's project tries to do, pull a lot of actors um, together, which might not be our role as, um, I don't know, as the visualization, <laughs> as the visualization experts, but it becomes part of a much larger project and field of operation in which things can happen. So maybe not this particular project, but other projects that we've all worked on, I think, address uh, issues from a lot of different points of view. Yeah. I, I think that point on representation is interesting um, relative to the data sets that we're using because um, I'm not going to be one to argue that everything should be filtered through data. I mean, uh, we're using it certainly, but um, to talk about things at a global scale, in some ways it's a necessity to even, to grapple with those kinds of representations. So um, with projects like this, I am wondering where the intervention happens from mm -hmm. a design standpoint, and it, it leads me to think that a, a, straight thing, a, a straight implication of this is that designers and research-minded designers could also be sites of geographic knowledge, mm -hmm. um, even at the global scale, that perhaps accounting for these types of slippages between the data, um, not just accounting for it in our work, but even producing counter data sets that circulate, that highlight those things could not solve them, but at least enter into the conversation or, or create, create a representation of those in the same sort of space that the other data sets are circulating in. Um, and that might be one thing that could be proposed uh, relative to the piece that we did. Yeah, I mean, in the piece that you did, uh, and I'll turn it to you, Keller, in a second, I just want to follow up on that. They, you chose two very specific data sets, and, and this is a pretty sophisticated audience here, so I don't, I don't feel like I have to put too fine a point of it, but like, we often sort of throw the word data out there and it's this kind of big meta word and it could just mean this whole thing that's floating around on the network. Um, but the idea that there are these sets of data that are being collected that are accessible and that how you make the decision or you curate that data which happens prior to even being able to visualize it. I guess, could you talk a little bit about the curation of the data um, that you sort of reached toward? Well, the, the, I mean, the population grid is a very politicized, both data sets are very politi they political and they're politicized. 
Um, and so, you know, the population grid is used um, at the UN, it's used by the Gates Foundation, you know, it's used to try and locate where to count every person on Earth. You know, that's a crazy idea, right? How can you count, how can you count every person on Earth? On the, uh, on the one hand. On the other hand, every person counts. Um, and so how do, you, how do you bridge the gap between those two facts? And they both, they, they, you know, they, they're equally important um, facts, but they're not so easy to, to resolve. Um, you know, so the census grid is very fallible. Some government, the governments don't actually release it in the same way that they count it. So there's all kinds of mistakes in that data set that then you try to compensate for them in other ways. But those policy-oriented people or those, you know, decision makers, when they see us playing with this data and it exposes some of the things that they might not have known or they actually are uh, working on very intensively and you found it just in this playful way, then, um, then it takes on, takes on another, another meaning, right? But it's very hard to work with one data set, I find. You can't just work with one data set. It's always easy. It takes the binary of them, the, the, com yeah. the tension between them to yeah. sort of activate the materials. Um, but Keller, you're, you know, for something called network, you're, you're not exactly dealing in data sets. You're, you're sort of really dealing more in narratives and scenarios. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, we, we were thinking of it, as I sort of said briefly, as a, as a heavy information system, as an information of lumpy solids that are in the cities um, and relationships between those, relationships between the needs of cities and, uh, and people um, as, that, as the information that was kind of coincidentally being exchanged mm -hmm. on, a, on a network. Um, so it was a network of people, but, 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 but very, yeah, um, very low tech. <laughs> um, very heavy and lumpy. Um, and we, you know, we, uh, just to, to, to your other question, we, you know, didn't, didn't w want the, the exhibition to be the end of the project or for that to be the, um, you know, the, what we were even making. So the hardest part of the whole project was and continues to be uh, gathering together this consortium of people and collaborators um, and getting a broad reach of, of uh, research that can uncover all the other potential, like thousands and millions of collaborators. Um, so that's, and, and I kind of refused, as if you remember in our conversations, I kind of refused to do it if it was just gonna be like a, you know, a research project it seemed that it had to be for us, for this one. It had to be something that it were at least we were promising to take it a little closer to a real um, right, like we developer. Really, we didn't get there, but I think there's still possibility to, you know, mm -hmm. to, to make it actually live. Um, and and we, we still could in the next couple of months. Um, you know, so that it was actually something uh, operating in real time. I think one of the reasons we ended up not actually having a live was had to do with the infrastructure of Venice itself um, and, and not having the network to support anything live. We really couldn't, we didn't have enough Wi-Fi connectivity um, to, to really do that um, in the pavilion. Well, we're used, I mean, where it's become, a, it will be in the spring at Yale, a, a collective seminar where students from all around the school, business, the arts, computer, computer science, uh, all the humanities, design, um, people working on migration and political science will work together on, on, the, on the project. So, you know, what universities you know, can do, mm -hmm. maybe they don't often do it, but give, give, students, a chance, yeah, give yeah. students a chance to cut their teeth on something and find out what it really takes to realize something. It kind of, there's a 
question sort of I have with sort of within this larger project that Anna and I talked about a lot, which is this idea of making visible. Um, and I think we're sort of talking about the, the difference maybe here between sort of the pointing at something and saying, hey, there it is, that kind of action of uh, making visible. And then some of the other projects, and I think colors yours points maybe in this direction towards the idea of a speculation. Um, it, it, the idea that the role of the designer is, is to sort of imagine something that doesn't exist um, and then and then sort of visualize it. And, and can, can we, without getting too in the weeds, ban banter a little bit back and forth between this difference between sort of the look there it is kind of visualization and the kind of visualization th in relationship to say speculation or that the, what is the future going to look like? I think that that's kind of comes for us from the Delaney quote of this idea, the necessary and urgent need to, to make visible. I mean, we, we were definitely in the look there it is category. Maybe we're, we're the part of the quote that uh, underlines the it's necessary yeah. to have, um, what, was that, what was that about images of the future, like concrete? Yeah. Um, Keller, Keller was talking about lumpy. I was uh, clear and vital, uh, necessary images. Those, those are the ones, yes. so, yeah. <laughs> Although I like the lumpy. We can get to mm. lumpy and messy <laughs> in a second, because I think that's also <laughs> part of it. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, color is your, oh, sorry, Laura, go ahead. But I, I, yeah, I think we're at a, you know, at a different moment now, so I'm, I'm interested in, um, in trying to understand how um, you, it's not enough to just look anymore. You actually have to see um, how things act um, and how they already have been active before they got to you. <laughs> you know, the data and the algorithms that produced them in the first place and what effects they've had, um, that what effects they might have um, on the future. So, you know, I do. I, starting a series of projects right now to, to think about that, to more proactive mm -hmm. in terms of how, if data can do bad things, can you undo, uh, are, there, are there ways of unmapping or demapping or, uh, you know, un undoing some of these things so that you can set it back on the right track, even if it's on a tiny right track, I don't know, but it is something I'm thinking about nowadays. I, and yeah. That was a nice tone. Yeah. I like feedback, though. Yeah. Um, so, um, s similar to Laura um, a little bit, I've been uh, personally doing some research arguing for the construction of da data as a design act, as a design of the environment, and then therefore looking very closely, historically, at the processes that happen inside these data collection and construction centers, at the way that they use materials quite similar to the way that designers use materials. They're using maps, diagrams. They're collectively agreeing on the terms uh, that they're working through and producing categories of space in that way. So um, I think in terms of proposing something beyond just look there it is, um, acknowledging that the data sets that we're using to point and say look there it is also have a design component to them. Maybe even un unselfconsciously, but they are designed. Um, could a sort of design inspection and, and design proposal move upstream um, from the use of data to the creation of data and imagine those as sites where we're working and proposing and imagining new methodologies of data creation, new methods of visualizing data within the lab before it gets um, sort of black boxed into a data set, goes out into the world, goes mobile, um, and has to argue on its own behalf independent of anyone who, who is part of the construction of it. So. Uh, if, if we are in some ways Im imagining uh, new sites to design space, mm -hmm. I actually imagine that designing space in those situations mm -hmm. is uh, fertile ground. Yeah. Yeah, I, when I think of your, your role's work, I don't see it as, a, uh, it's very different from, the, from an, a kind of rhetorical autonomous object in a gallery. It is nothing like that, you know. It is, the data is live. Um, and uh, it has another kind of instrumentality, in my view. It's a, first of all, it's an arg means an argument, and it's a, it, it it has a, so it doesn't doesn't have the kind of inert <laughs> you know uh, inert gallery object at, at all. It's very um, 
I mean, it's kind of bristling with uh, other kinds of charges and um, uh, possibilities. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think the, uh, you know, to sort of move from visualization of sort of data and sort of ideas also to the aesthetic questions of visualization, like both of these projects are so compelling in, you know, to, to an audience, like the kind of graphic orientation. And, and Keller, I loved that you showed like the hobo diagrams mm -hmm. and, and the kind of, like I remember having conversations with you about like the, the kind of emoji technique. And um, can you talk a little bit more about the, the kind of visualization and sort of aesthetic that comes out in many, um, both, both the kind of collage of the screen-based work, but also the little videos um, as well? Well, we, we, um, the idea was that um, uh, rather than kind of uh, giving a lot of trust to an algorithmic world um, that I don't trust, um, uh, <laughs> or that no one trusts, um, uh, that we, we were asking a question, could we develop, um, as I was saying, a no-tech blockchain, which would just kind of group to group, where groups of people cor corroborate each other in networks, and those two groups are the groups that that meet each other in this um, in this uh, platform. Um, so at the same time, we were wondering, you know, with 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 stuff that you just have in your phone, can you make some kind of glyph or signal that um, engenders trust because of its heterogeneity, because of the yeah the lumpiness of this of this the the sense of there being more than one person to corroborate it. Um, so it's, it's ugliness, it's, it's uh, the way it interacts with another glyph. Um, those were questions we were asking. Um, I, I got a little high sign of, uh, of to start to wrap it up, but um, can, can you tell the story about having your students film pieces uh, on their, uh, where they, because I think that was part of a remarkable part of the video is that there's all these uh, images of places from around the world, and we, you know, we saw it, and we were like, "Did you just send everybody?" And it turned out that you had just kind of networked your students to um, to take iPhone images of where they were. Yet they all had kind of a, a seamless global sort of feel to them. Yeah, we just we just kind of turned the you know that kind of distracted uh, uh, process plate that used to be in the back of Hollywood movies, you know, where, and then they put the the stars in front of it eventually, but, but um, so these were all just kind of like process plate, five, five minutes, two to five minutes, just like putting your iPhone out the window, just distractedly looking at, you know, what is passing by. So they well, just they did that they wherever they went. They went. Uh, when they went home, you mean? When when they, wherever they went, you know, they went. like the, you know, oh, the, okay. it was, we had instantly yeah. all we needed in, you know, yeah. a week. Um, That's great. I mean, it does speak to both the kind of global and the networked world that we live in that we could, you know, sort of take the small collective of people working on these projects because they were really tight on relatively tight budgets um, to be able to sort of capture what seems like a very globalized production. And I love that it's like students going home or are traveling, sort of it's their way of sort of speaking out the, uh, the premise. Um, do we have time for questions, Stephanie? Yeah, let, we Are can open up to a few questions, yeah. Um, I was wondering if you have any thoughts about this sort of phenomenon that I guess happens in the western part of the world of, I guess I'll call it trauma fatigue, and I guess Susan Sontag really mentions it when she talks about Abu Ghraib and the photos that came from there. Um, what type of um, affect do you think you would, hope to seek with the projects that you create through design using data, which talks about people, real people, these are numbers. Um, it, I'm interesting, interested to hear from both of you, um, from all three of you about those. Um, this is just one, one piece that, you know, I, I engage in a lot of different kinds of media depending on the purpose of 
what we're, you know, of what a project, of what a project tries to do. Um, you know, the work that, I'll, I'll just talk personally for myself, the work I do with data is to critique the data. Um, and if I was to do a project about people, I would start at a different point. But a lot of the work I do is about data and to critique the data in the ways in which it represents people so that you, you can think about things differently, right? So if I, I would, uh, you're talking about a different project, um, which is not, it's not way I would, not way I start a project. I don't know if that makes any sense, but I'm not trying to abstract people. I'm trying to address problems with data. Yeah, well, that has an effect on people. And in our project, I mean, it, it, it may have even been a direct reaction to, the, to, to trauma fatigue, which is why we're, where we started, really, which is a refusal to treat people who are migrating as victims yeah. and a refusal to congratulate ourselves. For, it, it, as important as it is to document that sort of traumatic experience, there were enough people doing that, you know, so we were saying, we were keen to say, no, no, these, these are not, these are, the, these are the next world leaders and here's how it could happen. Um, and just for the overall project, I think we were really clear that we did not want to get into that discourse of, um, of trying to problem solve or make better mm -hmm. um, as of something problematic that we saw on the ground, that the works in, in fact, are. I think almost across the board, are, are strangely optimistic in a time of crisis. Um, that that they're they're not necessarily solving, but they really are sort of digging, digging into sort of the humanity of the works uh, of of the, of the way we work and what is being shown. Yeah, I kind of is there a way to just get on with it? We have time for one more question. Yeah, um, I'm curious to know if you've continued collecting data about Puerto Rico after Maria and if that's something that you're continuing on working or if, um, you know, maybe the government has asked you for that data that you collected or other people are using it. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to be teaching a Puerto Rico seminar in the spring uh, with a, with a uh, Puerto Rican woman, Frances Negron Montaner, who's done a lot of work there and goes there a lot. So I don't know what we're gonna, exactly going to do yet. But and um, one of my former students, um, and I don't put it that way to take credit for his work, but just this is how I've come to know this. Um, he's um, uh, developing a series of technologies um, uh, for citizens in Puerto Rico to report in a very um, quick way the status of the infrastructure um, at different points in the island. Um, he's originally from Puerto Rico and has gone back and through his family have uh, tried to deploy this stuff. So in terms of data collection, it does seem to be coming, um, maybe a little bit like you're implying, coming the other direction, not from the state or from the federal government, but from on the ground and perhaps is beneficial to, to people elsewhere in that way. Federal government mm. is useless in the data about Puerto Rico. And Trump hasn't asked you to do No, he hasn't. Yeah, Trump hasn't asked. No. <laughs> okay. So I just wanted to thank you all so much for um, participating on this panel. And uh, I welcome everyone here to please get the community catalog.